thank you everybody for coming on this a little bit of a crazy night. Um, I really appreciate the turnout. It's more than we expected, I could say. Um, so I, I'm, I'm Kim Royer. I'm a wildlife biologist, actually the Fur Bearer Project Leader with the Fish and Wildlife Department. I'm going to do a very, very short introduction, and then I'm going to talk, turn it over to Dr. Dave Person, and uh, he's really going to steal the show. So he's going to give you all the biology background um, and provide you with the information that I think you're here to hear. Um, I just wanted to mention that if you wouldn't mind filling out these before and after, you'll notice there's a before side in red and an after side in blue. We'd really appreciate your feedback on coyotes in general, and even if you want to write about the presentation or anything else, uh, we'll collect those at the end. Do the befores before we speak and the afters after we speak. Um, so, so anyway, I'll start with my brief intro here. And again, I'm just basically going to talk about um, coyotes and the management and conservation challenges that the department faces. And like I said, uh, Dr. Person will then talk more about just sort of the basic biology and predator-prey relationships, with it, which I think you'd all be interested in. So you all probably already know that our mission is the conservation of fish, wildlife, and plants and their habitats for the people of Vermont. What you may not know is that includes over 25,000 species. And we all think of it as the iconic species that we know and, and love, but there's many, many other species that we're responsible for. Uh, anything from invertebrates to black bears to bobcats, uh, we're, we're the, the um, organization that's responsible for maintaining these into the future, as well as uh, the habitats, the natural communities, and the plants that keep those animals alive. And we take this, this role pretty seriously. But as, the, as most of you are aware of, the North American model of wildlife conservation was established in response to the amazing uh, degradation that occurred through the 1800s, the forest clearing and the extirpation of many of our wildlife species through that period. And from the ashes rose um, this process which allowed all of us to be stewards of these animals. So in, in the United States and North America, we are all stewards of our wildlife. And um, as in Europe, the landowner owns the wildlife. And so as a result of that model and the tax on ammunition and firearms and hunting and fishing and trapping licenses, um, many of these species have been recovered and sometimes now some of these are actually, um, we have some human wildlife conflicts with some of these species. I, I refuse to call them pests because they're not pests. It's usually an interaction between humans and, and them that make a problem. Um, and so Coyotes came in on their own, most of you know, from west of the Mississippi. Dave will go into this a little bit more. Uh, moved into the Northeast in the 30s and 40s. And um, they, are, they were replacing the wolf that was extirpated as a result of that land clearing that I talked about. And as a result, many people, because they were a species that came in after 100 years without a large predator, a middle predator like that, there are a lot of feelings of animosity towards this animal. And we feel like the coyote is actually here to stay. It's an animal that um, actually plays an important role in the system, and it deserves some respect. But public attitudes, as you all know, uh, run very high when it comes to coyotes. And people tend to either really love them or really dislike them. And sometimes that dislike depends on where you're coming from. And when you look at these pictures, you can see that if you have domestic animals like sheep and they've been attacked by coyotes, you're probably going to have a different feeling about the animal than if you've never in encountered them at all. Or if you, are, if you perceive that um, this nice big buck here is getting taken down by coyotes, that's going to influence how you feel about them. Or if the coyotes are hanging out on your front porch and you've got a little dog that you're worried about, that's going to influence how you think about coyotes. So coyotes tend to be an animal that people tend to either love or hate. And we find that there's some very disparate and polarized public attitudes around coyotes. Um, there still remains a deeply rooted perception that coyotes compete with hunters for, for deer. 
And on the other end of the spectrum, there's this sort of disnified view of how coyotes operate in the wild, that they, you know, they love everything and, and they love each other and, you know, they don't ever have to kill anything. So we have these two very polarized views around coyotes. Uh, but what we have seen is um, this animal can become easily habituated. And these are just one month's um, headlines from newspapers around the country in the month of May, last May. And you can see that coyotes, when they live in areas where they're in close proximity to people, we often start to have coyote-human interactions that make people nervous, if, to say the least. And what we're worried about is that the public doesn't value or want to conserve pests. So once these animals are considered vermin or pests, then it becomes very much more difficult for us to create a management or conservation policy that's going to keep these animals on the landscape into the future. Yeah, sure. Uh, so this one here is Culver City's officials approved $210,000 in a coyote management program. Mother, four-year-old son, attacked by coyote in, pa in park. Uh, watch out for coyotes in West County, police warn. State lawmakers look to help those hunting, climbing, hunting, uh, oh, hunting, help those hunting, climbing Pennsylvania coyote population. So clearly, where there are interactions with coyotes that are negative, they, people start to say, we want these animals eliminated. In Vermont, we don't think we have, we have some of these interactions starting, but historically we have not had very many because we think our coyotes are fairly wary because they're heavily hunted and trapped. And so that keeps them, um, keeps them wary of people to some degree. That's not the only reason, but to some degree, it, it, it's n enough negative reinforcement in some places that we don't have these interactions as often as some other places. The other thing we have to consider when we're managing for a resilient species like coyote is we've got 16 other fur-bearing species that we are responsible for, two of which are on the threatened and endangered species list, um, three of which are intensively monitored, fisher, bobcat, and otter, and one which requires quite a bit of time dealing with human beaver conflicts. So uh, we, have to, we have to really be pragmatic about where we put our resources. And we have not collected a lot of information on coyotes just because we really haven't had the time to do that. And we know the animal is very resilient and responds, um, it responds to, um, to hunting in a way that it actually, the population can actually grow. Um, and we also are worried about the habitat for these species and trying to conserve the habitats that are going to main, maintain these animals on the landscape. So one of the things we're concerned about beso besides all of those is that there's some threats that are coming to many of these animals around habitat loss, climate change, species decline, and changing public attitudes. All of these are things that we have to think about going forward. And trying to focus on these things is important, um, and we need to do these, we need to focus on these together. Because public divisiveness will create roadblocks to really good management, and so that's, what's, that's where we're trying to find ways to find common ground around some of these species so that we can move forward and address some of these really, um, really uh, negative consequences for the future for many of these species. So our goal for coyotes is to ensure that they're here on the landscape, maintain and protect habitat for all species, um, maintain public support and respect for all wildlife species, and provide opportunities into the future for everybody to enjoy wildlife through hunting, trapping, and, 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 um, and just watching, bird watching or wildlife watching. And so we want to try to do that through building bridges and figuring out how to bring people together around these animals. And this is, coyotes are not the only species where this is an issue, where we have this clash of public values. Um, there's many, many other species where we're starting to see this happen. And we're just worried that future efforts towards conservation management of our species, of our wildlife species, are going to be derailed by some of these polarization issues. And so we're looking for ways to, to bring people together. 
And one of the ways we're doing that is um, our next speaker is Dr. David Person. And I've actually known uh, Dr. Person since the 80s when he left New Jersey as the Deer Project leader and came to Vermont to do the Addison County Coyote Study. And he got his master's studying coyotes in Vermont in the 80s and then went on to get his PhD in Alaska and then Alaska Fish and Game hired him as their predator prey scientist for 22 years, I think, right? Well, I was there for 22 years, 18 years with Fish and Game. 18 years with Fish and Game. And then he retired and returned, in his retirement, came back to Vermont. So we're very lucky to have him here. Uh, He's, he's so knowledgeable about predators and, and coyotes in particular. And uh, I'll turn this over to you, Dave, and sure. thank you so much. I'll also say that Dave is doing this um, as an independent person with uh, gratis. So, no pun uh, huh? No, independent person, no pun intended. Yeah, right. Independent Dave person, person. Um, yeah, so, and so uh, I really appreciate that he's willing to come and speak to us and, and partner with us on this. Um, Kim, thanks so much for that introduction. Um, I just, uh, just to, to reiterate, I am um, a, uh, uh, an ex-fish and game research biologist, uh, most of my time in the state of Alaska. Um, but I'm retired now, and thankfully retired now. And uh, I'm retired, and my basic job right now is to build muzzleloading guns. Um, and when building muzzleloading guns, I have a shop in Braintree, right on Braintree Hill. And uh, I have a porch and a nice shop, and I end up somehow being a, an attractive magnet for lots of old retired Vermonters, uh, farmers, loggers, and others that come over who want to talk about guns and history. And, and uh, in those conversations, um, things like coyotes and bobcats and deer, they, they always come up. And one of the things that I gleaned from those conversations is that there's a lot of, there is certainly a lot of hard opinions, strong opinions, but one of the things that is missing is that most of the public has never really had any good explanations or any good presentations about predator-prey dynamics. They get talks about coyote ecology and biology or deer biology and ecology, but predator-prey dynamics are complicated and most of you are probably not exposed to the actual behaviors, the actual mechanisms that go on when a coyote population is in an area and prey populations are in the same area. Um, and what do they mean to each other? You know, coyotes kills a deer, certainly. But th what does that mean? Does it really matter much? Um, and so predator-prey dynamics is a missing piece that I think the public is not aware of, hasn't had much exposure to. And that's where I come in. That was the piece that I thought when I was talking to Kim about doing these presentations, that was the piece I thought I could bring to this um, because that was my background. And particularly in the state of Alaska, I was the predator-prey biologist for all of Alaska south of Yakutat. It's a pretty big area. Um, and I spent 22 years in that environment studying predator-prey dynamics with wolves, deer, bears, and people. And don't forget people because even, you know, of course, people are important here in terms of harvesting deer, harvesting coyotes, harvesting other fur bearers. But in Alaska, sometimes there are people who's the only red meat they ever have in their entire lives are deer and maybe caribou and maybe moose. They never see any other kind of meat unless it's uh, red meat, unless it's fish. So, so the human component is very important in all of this. Um, and it was never far from my research in terms of how important that human component was. Just a quick little summary of me. Um, I did work on coyotes in the state of Vermont in the Champlain Valley back in the mid-80s um, to get my master's degree at the University of Vermont. Um, and that study was basically descriptive, looking at the ecology of coyotes, home ranges, food habits, things like that. At that time, not much else was known. There was some work done in Maine, there was some work done in uh, New Hampshire, but nothing in Vermont. And there really wasn't a great deal known about what role these coyotes were playing in the <laughs> ecosystems. And in my case, I chose the Champlain Valley because it was fairly close to the university, so it was relatively convenient. But it also had deer, it also had rabbits, it also had a diverse prey base and a lot of coyotes, so it made a very good study area. 
Um, so I spent four years there doing that work. And as well as looking at coyotes, we also looked at their interactions with red and gray foxes because there are a lot of data that suggests that particularly with red foxes, there is a lack of coexistence. They, there is actual direct competition. Coyotes will kill red foxes. Um, but we didn't know much about gray foxes because gray foxes um, are, there's not much research on gray foxes anywhere. And so we included gray foxes with red foxes. And one of the interesting things with, with the fox situation is red foxes, most of the red fox genetics that you have in this country, we have in, in North America, actually are derived from Europe. And the gray fox is actually our indigenous fox, not the red fox. The gray fox is actually our indigenous fox. And what's very interesting is when you had the early colonists come over and get well established, and especially those who used to do fox hunting back in England, they found that the little gray fox wasn't much fun because instead of running, it would go down a hole or up a tree. And so they brought red foxes over because they could use them for their, their, their fox hunting. Well, it's that going to the ground or up a tree is why gray foxes seem to coexist very nicely with coyotes because they don't run. And if they run, they get killed. If they go up a tree, they survive. So they can, they can actually live in close coexistence with coyotes where red foxes are in competition. Anyway, I, I left Vermont, went to Alaska um, to do my, my PhD work on the wolves of the islands of southeast Alaska. Um, and um, it's, a, it's a fascinating place, a uh, fascinating wolf population because this is mostly on islands. So we're talking wolves that are swimming in the ocean, in some cases up to two to three miles in the open ocean um, to go from one island to another. Um, it's a remarkable ecosystem, temperate rainforests, um, huge trees, a lot of deer, a lot of other animals like black bears and brown bears. It's a fascinating place to be. But it's also a very useful and interesting place to be to study predator-prey dynamics because each of those islands offers slightly different conditions. Therefore, they become a, an actual natural laboratory, a natural series of experiments. So you can learn a great deal if you can just, just uh, gut out the bad weather and the other disadvantages of working in southeast Alaska. We, when, you, when you work on predators, you, if you aren't just interested in the ecology of the predator animal, if you're trying to understand predator-prey dynamics, how they fit into a predator-prey community, you almost always end up studying their prey. It's, it's by default you're going to start looking at their, because that's what drives the system, is the prey, and how they, their dynamics go relative to the predator and relative to their habitat. So I always gravitate to the prey, in this case, Sitka black-tailed deer, and one of the things that we really were, were very interested in looking at, not only is mortality due from coyotes, but mortality from black bears. Um, there are very high densities of black bears, perhaps in some areas as much as many as two to three to four per square mile. Um, these bears are subsidized by salmon. And in the springtime, in June, they prey on neonate fawns. And about 35 to 40 percent of all neonate fawns are, are killed by black bears within about a month of birth. So it's a huge source of mortality. Um, a big chunk of it is compensatory, but I'll talk about that a little bit later. But anyway, there's, so there's a lot more to the system than just wolves and deer. The bears are a complicating factor, and people are a complicating factor. I also pioneered using dogs in my wildlife work, and I just thought I'd show you. This is my dog, Bella, and I am calling in a doe and Bella will, will actually decoy the doe. And uh, this is a training film. I, we don't actually do darting in this film. But she would actually allow me to get a perfect shot to the rump of the deer without any risk of hurting the deer. I'm just blowing a fawn bleat to bring the doe in. Now, right there, would have been, could have gotten a perfect shot without any, any. And one of the things I learned with working with Bella is I learned to watch her, because she would always pick up the deer coming in way before I would. And you watch her head when this starts. She's going to, right there, she's got the deer. She knows where it's coming in. I don't even know it's there yet. My graduate student, Sophie, is doing the videoing. 
and the, the, I'm standing right beside that tree, that deer doesn't care at all that I'm there. It's just focused on the dog. And because Bella won't move a muscle, the, do, the, the deer just keeps wanting to come in, and that would give us an opportunity to, to get a good, safe shot to the rump. When we started using Bella as a decoy, our mortality, capture mortality of deer went to zero. It wasn't very high to begin with, but it went to zero when we, brought, when we used the dog. And we use dogs for other things as well. So let's go on to coyotes here. Um, and uh, just to finish up, I retired from the state of, uh, from the state of Alaska. Um, I actually I didn't retire initially, I quit. I just got sick of the crazy politics involved with predator prey and management. Um, it just, uh, after a while, kind of drove me nuts. Um, so I could retire, I retired, came back to Vermont. Um, and I've been building muzzle and guns and happier ever since. Um, it's really nice to work on something that really nobody cares about. Um, anyway, so just before we started here, um, this nice lady here asked me, well, what do we have here? Uh, what kind of coyote is it? Is it a koi dog? Is it a, is it a uh, um, koi wolf? Um, is it the infamous Labro Yodi Poo? Um, what do we have? Well, we really have a coyote, and they did come from the west. You have the Canadian coyotes coming in from the north. You have the southern Texan coyotes coming in from the south. And you have an invasion from the Midwest as well. Um, and this occurred shortly after the period of time when most wolves were decimated and landscapes had been changed dramatically by human development. So we sort of created the conditions that allowed this to happen. Oops, that's right, this is one of those animated slides. And here you're going to give you some time frame. About 1918 or so, there's some evidence of coyotes beginning to, to move into the Northeast, into Southern um, uh, Ontario and Quebec, and then into the Northeast. Uh, 1940s uh, in, the, in New York State and Vermont, I believe, about late 1940s. Um, in Pennsylvania, you start seeing them in the 1940s, um, although there was evidence of coyotes in, in uh, Indiana, Ohio, back as early as 1919. So they didn't waste a lot of time till after you know, uh, the wolves were decimated. They really moved on pretty quickly here. Um, and they, uh, they came in um, slowly. There was a lot of concern about what this animal was. Certainly there was evidence that some of them were bigger. And of course, at that early stage, there was this idea that they may have met, mated with dogs. They might have been a hybrid with dogs somehow and become a, a koi dog. Well, the problem with a koi dog is that first off, if it's, um, uh, it would have to be a female coyote and a male dog. Because if it was a female dog, the dog's going to come home, the puppies are not going to be in the wild. So it would have to be a female coyote and a male dog. Well, male dogs don't hang around to help the pups. They're usually mating and they're gone, kind of like some politicians we know. Um, and they're off looking for the next bigger, better deal. Um, and so mom would be out there with a load of litter of puppies and nobody would help her raise them. So the chances of survival would be pretty darn low if it was a mating with, between a coyote and a dog. What we do know is based on genetics, it's not a dog, it's wolves. And the genetics of Canis, Canis lupus, which are wolves, Canis latrans, which are coyotes, in North America is a mess. It's a total mess. Because we actually, in most of North America, we have this mix between coyotes and wolves. So out in Minnesota, where you have wolves around the, the, the Great Lakes, and in southern Ontario, where you have wolves, they tend to be mostly wolf, 75% wolf or so, and maybe a quarter coyote. When you go east and you get into Vermont and New Hampshire and Maine where you have a coyote, it tends to be about 75% coyote with 25% wolf. But there's this continuum all throughout North America with very little, um, uh, 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 call it pure, pure strains or pure, pure uh, uh, pedigrees anywhere except in the high Arctic with wolves and the south. The, the southwest with coyotes. So where the two overlap, and particularly anywhere where coyotes and where wolves had been decimated there, so there was a potential for the behavioral barriers between wolves and coyotes that would break down and allow intermating. 
anywhere along the interface, you're going to have this introgression of coyote genes into wolves and wolf genes into coyotes. And so we have this sort of mismatch. And the, uh, we have a true coyote, but there is wolf blood in those coyotes. And they are significantly larger than what you typically will find in Montana. Um, they are upwards of 50% uh, larger in some cases, and even a little bit bigger than that. Um, in the coyotes that I um, radio collared in the Champlain Valley of Vermont, um, they ranged in size for adults, adult males, ranged from about 32 pounds to 47 pounds. And I measured one out of New Hampshire, I believe, that weighed 54 pounds. Now, 54 pounds is getting to be about the size of, an adult, of a, a, a juvenile wolf pup in the fall. So, you know, you're, you're getting a little overlap there almost in, in allometric size. Um, the variation, you mentioned you were seeing those blonde coyotes. Well, there's one right there from the Champlain Valley. Um, the, pel the pelage can be incredibly variable from almost black and dark gray to the sort of the classic uh, buff below and, and gray on, and, and black in the back, or like this, ge this actually gentleman right there. Um, they uh, they uh, are uh, incredibly variable in terms of their pelage. Um, and um, the, um, um, the, uh, the uh, genetics of coyotes are such, they're, such, they're so variable that there isn't really very um, often do you find any areas that have particularly blonde wolves or particularly dark um, coyotes or particularly dark uh, light coyotes. There's a real mix almost everywhere. Um, and part of that's because these animals disperse. They don't just stay in their local area. When they're looking for their own home ranges, their own territories, they go long distances. So there's an intermingling going on all the time. And that intermingling covers a great deal of territory. Coyotes are territorial. They also have what we call home ranges. And this slide illustrates what we mean between the difference between a home range and a territory. Down at the bottom are the home ranges of five coyote groups in Addison County. Now the first thing to notice there is that there is some overlap between the home ranges, between neighboring groups, but notice that virtually all the space is occupied. So that area when I was working there was pretty darn saturated with coyotes. There was not much new space for any, uh, any pair to settle in. Um, when you look at where they spend most of their time within a home range, which is the middle series, these are all the, these are the same, same groups right here, the same five coyote groups. This is what we call a 75% home range. What we're looking at there is simply what we call a core area of activity, where they are the most. And when you look at that, you can see that the overlap is diminished almost to the point of there is no overlap. So this is a home range. This is what we would probably refer to as a territory. A territory is a place that is defended, actively defended. They don't necessarily defend that overlap area, but they will defend these core areas. And then the smaller 50% home ranges there represent generally springtime and early summer when they're active at their dens and they're concentrating their activity at the den sites so that they have a really peak of activity in a much, much smaller area. The coyotes, which were numerous in the fall, and, and let's say in the winter, you saw them everywhere, all of a sudden they disappear in April, May, and June. And you find the concentrated activity in one place and no activity in the places you used to see them in the wintertime. It's because they're really focusing around the dens. We look at the size of those home ranges in Vermont, about nine, uh, 30 square kilometers, basically a little, over, little under 10 miles, square miles. In the forests of Maine, 70 square kilometers, which is roughly going to be somewhere in the neighborhood about 19 square miles or so, 19, 20 square miles. Um, the significance here is not the size so much. It's the fact that the size of the home range represents the richness of the environment. If you're a coyote family, you don't want to have to go around a home range that's any larger than you need it to make your living, to find your prey, to raise your puppies. And so in a rich environment, you're going to have a smaller home range, a smaller territory probably as well. In a poorer environment, you are going to have more space that you're going to have to occupy. And so the size of the home range oftentimes represents the richness of the environment. Addison County was a very rich environment for coyotes. They had deer, but they had cottontail rabbits, woodchucks. And even more important, they had the carcasses of heifers and cows that died 
particularly in the fall and winter, that got dumped. But they couldn't get buried because of frozen ground. And that food source was a bonus food source. It made for a very, very rich environment. In Maine, you just have forests, essentially, and deer and other small mammals in that forest. Those are a much poorer environment for a predator like coyotes. Um, and so their home ranges are much larger. This imp the um, implication is, of course, that the densities are lower. So if you've got a smaller home range, you can pack in more coyotes. If you've got larger home ranges, you're going to have fewer coyotes. And coyote family groups, call them a pack if you will, but a family group, generally average about seven or eight individuals for in the fall, which is where they're going to be the most numerous before there's any dispersal. So you can, you can see that, that, that you know, the richest of the environment, the richer the environment, the more coyotes you're going to pack in there, the more coyote groups you're going to pack in there. And of course, the implication for that is if you were going to go out and do some sort of predator control, like you're going to try to eliminate coyotes from an area, you're going to have a much greater problem because you're going to have many more family groups that you're going to have to deal with than in an area that's of a, a poor environment. Um, the coyotes are denning in um, April and May. Um, generally, May would be the, the, would begin the peak of the denning season. They mate in January or February. Um, they are, um, uh, have a 63-day gestation period, and they become sexually active at about 22 months, about two years. So it takes a coyote about two years before they're off looking for a mate somewhere. Um, they mate, like I say, in February, late January. They give birth the end of April, early May, and the female around April is looking for a den site. And a den site doesn't necessarily have to be too elaborate. It may be just a hole in the ground where there's some loose dirt. It might be a hole between the root wads of a tree, but it's going to be dry, and it's going to be within probably about 100 meters of water because when mom has puppies, she's got to drink a lot of water while she's lactating. So she's not going to travel far from water. So you're not going to have a coyote den sitting way up in some dry mountaintop somewhere. They're going to be in a place where they can get fresh water within a very easy distance. Um, this is in contrast, you know, these small holes. And generally, I've, I've not seen a coyote den that was more than just a natal chamber, single natal chamber. In contrast, wolves, the biggest wolf den, and I, I've crawled in about 30 to 35 wolf dens. We used to actually, these pictures, these are actually wolf pups, but cow pups would look about the same. But we actually snaked in the active dens a um, video camera with a 16-foot flexible shaft lens. So it's all like a long snake. And we would snake that down and actually video the puppies and count them all to get a, an estimate of litter size in that, in that um, um, wolf den. And of course, mom and pop and all the other wolves are running around howling and barking at you. It's pretty exciting. Um, but the, uh, um, but the, uh, um, uh, the method allowed us to get good estimates of of the number of, of puppies in the dens. Well, one of the wolf dens that I actually went into um, had 11 entrances, and it had tunnels up to 60 feet long. It, co it covered almost a, about uh, a sixth of an acre. It was huge in size. Um, but uh, coyotes don't do anything like that. They, they concentrate their activity during the denning season. This just shows you one wolf group here in Addison County. This is showing their, their, their uh, home range during the uh, winter months. The dotted line is showing the home range during the denning season. There's the territory, and there's the territory during the denning season. They're concentrating their activity during denning. These little grid squares just show you when kite was active at that spot, so the frequency of activity. So the taller the bar, the more active they are at that location. And you can see they're very active at the den sites. Um, that's, you would expect that. Um, again, here's another group here. And you have, you know, harmonic mean, uh, the, the, uh, the territory here, and then you have, uh, during denning, it's really compressed a lot smaller. Um, they're really concentrating their activity around the den sites. When you look at the, uh, the, the breeding pair and their activity at dens, this is, these are radio locations within 100 meters of a den, air, dens, uh, an actual den, active den. And you can see in April, this breeding female right here, the black bar, she's, of course, spending most of her time at the den. As you get into May, she spends a little less time. She's lactating. She's going out to get water to drink. And when you get into June, she's even spending less time. The male is beginning to spend more time. So as she goes away from the den, he comes to the den, basically babysitting the kids. And the interesting thing here is you have this juvenile female from the previous year. And you can see here, she's not anywhere near the den generally in April. But in May, she shows up. 
And she actually, by June, is spending more time at the den site babysitting the kids than mom and dad. Um, so there is really family cooperation here in terms of, of, uh, of, of raising the litters of pups. Um, the thing you need to know about coyote family groups is that they really are mostly a family group, meaning that they're a, a coyote breeding pair and then there are their siblings, their, their young that they've produced. Now, typically, the young are of the year, meaning that the young from the previous year are leaving. They're leaving in their first year, and definitely at least in their second year, to locate their own territories, their own, basically establish their own family groups if they can. Um, but the decision for leaving is largely food-based. And this is where you start getting larger groups of coyotes, family groups. Those typically are the breeding pair with kids from several years, litters from several years, because the kids aren't leaving, because there's so much food. They're like the millennials. They love it in the basement. And, and, and so, so they're not leaving because they're getting all the food they need and all the, the resources they need. There's no reason for them to move out until the hormones take over and they want to breed. Um, and then it becomes, you know, a decision, do I stay and take the smorgasbord, to, you know, take advantage of it, or do I leave and mate and actually raise a family on my own? And so that becomes the decision based on their, their reproduction um, more than food when they get to be two years old. But if there isn't much food, they tend to then leave in their first year. So, because there's no reason to hang around, because you're not going to get well fed in the home range at home, so you might as well take off somewhere else and try it best somewhere else. Um, so, so the family group's very fluid, and it really is a function of food. If you're seeing large groups of coyotes in areas, that generally means they're well fed. The food resources are very rich. Um, you won't see that in a place like Maine, where in the forests of Maine, where the richness of the environment is probably pretty low. Um, they're going to be dispersing in their first year. When we look at uh, the, the mortality, um, about 27, this is based on my radio collared animals, um, about 27% of the resident adults die every year. So about a quarter of them die every year. These are the resident adults. These are the, they're staying in the pack, they're not leaving, they're right there in the pack, home range, pack territory. And, and they have about a quarter of them are going to die every year. 20% of juvenile mortality after the neonatal period, we don't know what neonatal mortality is. Now when I say neonate, neonate means you know, at birth. So neonates, we consider neonate animals basically to be those animals at birth and then up to maybe about a month, maybe a month and a half, 90 days later. So when I say juvenile mortality after 90, um, um, neonatal period, we're talking basically juveniles from midsummer on. Um, and they have about 20% 20, 20 not statistically different than the other resident coyotes. Um, we didn't detect any mortality in resident subadults, those who stayed over. They didn't disperse their first year, they stayed over in their second year. Um, but our sample size was just too small. I'm not surprised we didn't detect much mortality. There's probably the same mortality here as here. They're probably, if we got a big enough sample, we'd see it would be pro probably pretty, pretty consistent. The main point here, however, is when you leave, your mortality goes way up. And if you don't settle in an area very quickly, you're not going to probably do it at all. You're not going to survive to reproduction. So annual mortality for dispersers, dispersing is a very risky business. Looking for a mate is a very risky business. And your mortality rate goes up considerably. It can be as high as 70% for wolves in some areas. Um, so coyotes and wolves share the same, the same um, uh, risk factors when they disperse. Um, they're going through different territories. They don't know the landscape very well. They might get killed by other coyotes or wolves. Um, and then they also are, risky, are at greater risk to hunters and trapping and being hit by vehicles because they're in unfamiliar territory. Of the wolves that we, I mean, the coyotes that we monitored, 10 were shot, one was trapped, three were hit by vehicles. The key there, not so much the breakdown of, of the different sources, the overwhelming source of mortality in coyotes is human based. Natural mortality from other coyotes, from disease, is relatively low um, compared to sources. People kill coyotes, and people are the main sources of the death of coyotes. Now, that's not to say that if people didn't kill coyotes, that something else wouldn't kill many of those coyotes um, otherwise, uh, either, either. So 
For example, if, 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 uh, if um, the, the risk of disease would go up um, in, in, in a population if it wasn't being harvested, there'd be because the population density for any kind of density dependent disease would place them at greater risk. So there's a bit of compensation that's going to be going on there between human mortality and other sources of mortality that are not human based because the human base basically overwhelms that other source. And there's a bit of a compensation that may be actually occurring within a population. Um, dispersers, they travel quite a ways. Now, these are just what we knew where we got the collars back. We had some that just disappeared. Who knows? They could be in, in, uh, in Quebec somewhere. So they might be, maybe for all we know, they might be in Indiana. Well, we don't know. Um, but they, they do disperse long distances. Um, and um, um, only a small fraction of them actually ever get a chance to settle into a, into a territory and establish their own um, home ranges. Unfortunately, the success of dispersers is one of the hardest things to study. And it's, there's not a lot of good data on dispersal and coyotes in terms of their success rates. Food habits, well, it's pretty eclectic. They like lots of things. They like mice, they like porcupines, they love woodchucks, they like deer. <coughs> and when we look at their scats, um, it gives us a pretty good seasonal picture. Now keep in mind, this is the percent occurrence of, a, of any kind of evidence of, the, of, of an animal in the scat. So in other words, this is not volume. We're not talking that here, for example, we're not saying 40% of their diet in spring is deer. No, 40% of scats had deer hair in it. So it is an indication of changes through the seasons it is not telling you volume. Um, in this case, we see in the spring and summer, you deer very much in the spring. Um, and that's probably going to be deer either in a weakened state from the winter or carcasses, deer that died during the winter time. That's probably the biggest source in the spring. When it overlaps into this early summer, late spring, early summer, those would be probably neonate fawns. And we know that coyotes can um, kill a lot of neonate fawns. Probably the, um, the highest percentage that's been recorded is from Georgia, um, near the Savannah River in Georgia. And a study down there, I believe um, coyotes um, killed about 50% of neonate fawns within, you know, within one month of birth. Um, and they have black bears down there too who are also killing fawns. So, so they, can, they can take a significant number of fawns. Um, in um, uh, uh, the Northeast here, in studies that have looked at uh, deer mortality due to, well, deer mortality due to any source, um, the, the uh, predation on neonate fawns um, seems to be considerably lower. Um, but there is definitely evidence of, har of killing adult deer as well. There's no, there's no doubt that uh, um, coyotes are capable of taking an adult deer. Um, but the primary mortality is going to come to the neonate fawns. Um, and there's a reason for that because at that time, mom and dad need a nice big little package of meat to bring back to the kids. And a fawn is a perfect little package of meat. Um, plus, killing a fawn, you don't risk getting killed yourself. One of the things that, that uh, uh, is pretty clear with looking at the, the physical condition of coyotes and wolves throughout the seasons is that they do best in winter. Coyotes put on weight, wolves put on weight, they're healthier, they are more active in winter because they actually have a more access to food in winter, particularly with, in this case would be deer, um, but also um, here, snowshoe hare would be a huge one. Um, in the summertime, the pickings are a little thinner, a little leaner. Um, and so they tend to lose weight based on, one, their females are lactating, they're, they're feeding kids, so that's one reason why they're, they're, they're going to be losing weight. The secondly is they have a little bit harder time finding food. And taking down a deer by a coyote in the middle of summer yeah, they can do it, but it's really risky. Deer are not knockovers. I mean, I don't know if any of you, you know, have any, any clue. Deer, even for a wolf, deer are not, is not a knockover. It's not, you don't just, they don't just walk up to a deer and, you know, just push it over and kill it. Um, deer are dangerous prey. Um, beaver are dangerous prey. Cottontail rabbits, not so much. And so there is a real emphasis in summer, particularly on those smaller animals. Um, here you have, um, um, you also see the influence of livestock, the blue bars. They're picking up in the late summer and into winter, and those are those frozen carcasses mainly. 
Um, and then you also have some other mammals thrown in here. Um, uh, sheep, um, I didn't find a lot of evidence of sheep in the, in the scats. Uh, there wasn't a lot of sheep growing in that area, so that's probably one explanation for it. Um, but uh, in terms of other mammals, they kill, pork, they kill uh, skunks, they kill foxes, they kill raccoons. Um, I, I just can't imagine what it would be like to kill a raccoon. It would probably be a pretty miserable thing to do. But, but uh, um, um, they do kill other larger mammals. Um, rodents, they take large rodents in the spring and summer specifically. Well, of course, in the wintertime, a lot of those rodents just aren't there. Um, in this case, that would be beaver, porcupine, woodchucks. Small rodents, they do take in the summer and winter, um, summer, fall, and winter. That is a major staple in their diets, are small voles and, and mice. Um, and also rabbits and hare. You can see rabbits is a big one in the wintertime. Those are snowshoe hare, as well as cottontails. Um, and so uh, coyotes are really um, uh, effective at killing rabbits. Um, and rabbits can be a subsidizing, and in this case hare as well, can be a subsidizing food source, meaning that the, uh, the coyotes can really do well on those rabbits, despite, for example, the density of deer. So there are circumstances in which you could have a deer population that's very low, and you have coyotes basically subsidized by rabbits. They don't really need the deer, but they do take deer occasionally, and that mortality to those deer may be enough at that point to suppress their numbers because they've been hammered by, let's say, two or three bad winners. So there are circumstances in which the prey base plays a role in how the coyotes might affect, let's say, deer, because they can be subsidized. In the West with wolves, they get subsidized by salmon. Salmon can decouple the wolf population, their, their sort of uh, um, uh, physical condition, from the population density of the deer that they mainly prey on, because they don't need, depend on the deer alone. They've got other sources that they can switch to. This just shows birds and vegetation, nuts, berries, all kinds of things, corn even. Um, they're pretty much in all the scats. They are very omnivorous, kind of like a bear. So let's talk about predation, because predation is probably the, one of the dominant themes for most folks who want to talk about coyotes or wolves, and certainly I think a, an important one to discuss here in Vermont. Of course, coyotes are predators on livestock, and there are conditions in which um, they can do a significant amount of damage. Um, but I don't believe in Vermont that they are a scourge of livestock in Vermont. Um, I don't think there's any evidence that, uh, that livestock producers in general, except for perhaps some local, local producers, have had um, you know, a really economically devastating um, uh, effects from, from coyote predation. Um, there are places out west where that has happened, um, but um, it's not, not that common. Um, and so livestock predation is significant, um, but it is something that is one, um, generally localized, and there is some good evidence that if you have a group of coyotes in your area and they're not preying on your livestock, if you wipe them out, you risk having a new group come in who learn to kill your sheep or kill your chickens or kill your, kill your goats. Um, and so it can be a good thing or a bad thing to, to take out a, a family group of coyotes that may be adjacent to a farm. Um, and you may not know that. Um, research out west in California showed very clearly that the major individuals in a coyote population who kill livestock and actually the ones who lead all predation are the breeding pair. The other, the other members of the pack are kind of hanging on. They're like, you know, it's not like everybody's out there with their radios going, okay, you go right, I'll go left, you go right, you know, we're going to push these guys over here, we're going to push these guys over there, and, and, and we're all going to jump on them all at the same time. Now, they're not African wild dogs. What it's more like is one coyote says to the other, hey, Benji, you go take that deer down, and we'll help you eat it. Um, and, and it's more like, you know, hangers on, you know, they're, they're, and, and it's, the breed, it's the breeding pair that really do the killing. Well, it's the same thing with livestock. And so to, to prevent livestock predation, you've got to get that breeding pair. And that's really tough because if you go out and just randomly kill coyotes, you don't necessarily going to take out the individuals who are doing the killing. So you may not solve your problem. The one device that did work very effectively were, were the, uh, what they call the uh, poison collars on sheep. These are the collars that, you know, the sheep died 
Um, but the coyote that killed that sheep also died. Um, and those methods worked quite well. Virtually all other methods of eliminating coyotes from an area were not very effective, and not very effective in the long term. In other words, there was something that had to be constantly applied, which by default means something that was very expensive. So it's a problem, yes, um, and there is no easy solution to it, but you have to be a little careful about what you do and how you interpret it. Um, again, coyote family groups might not kill your sheep, and they are going to keep out other groups. However, there are those who buy into that story as well very strongly. They say, well, you don't have to kill any coyotes. You know, you just make sure you got, you know, you don't want any turnover in the coyote population because you're going to have these coyotes out there protecting your livestock. Well, the reality of that is research has shown that that effect is real in certain places under certain circumstances. It has happened. It's been documented. But the effect doesn't last long because in those coyote family groups, there's turnover. And the fact that that breeding pair is not going to necessarily last for more than two or three years. And so eventually they're going to turn over anyway. Um, and so any duration, any benefit of that is going to be fairly short. And I'll just give you a little anecdote. In Alaska, on the Toke River, the Toke uh, caribou herd, um, we went in there and we, as, a, as a measure, of, of the, the state of Alaska, the Alaska fishing game has had probably as much experience in doing predator control as any organization in North America. I mean, it's, it's got decades of experience doing this kind of stuff. And we run into the same kinds of public issues where people are against it, people propose it. You know, it all depends on their, their point of view. And so we're always looking for alternatives to lethal controls, just to, because publicly it seems to be more satisfactory to a lot of people. Well, anyway, so in one experiment, we took an area probably the size, half the size of Vermont, and we gave every male coyote, uh, every male wolf in that population a vasectomy. We snipped them all. And the effect, idea was that you have these territorial males, they're not dead, they're maintaining their territories, but they can't breed, they're sterile. And so you're going to see a reduction in wolves because they're going to keep out any dispersers. It, they're going to actually prevent other wolves from coming in and, and you know, depredating increasing population level and reducing predation on this case caribou and it worked but it only worked for about two or three years because those wolves die and they do there is turnover and the other thing you have to do when, when you do that is you've got to then prohibit hunting and trapping of wolves in that area because you don't want your hunters and trappers out there killing those vasectinized males right because you're just going to ruin the effect that you just spent millions of dollars trying to achieve. Um, and so it is a, a short-term effect. It's a very expensive one. And when you hear people talk about, you know, these sort of natural controls on predation, like on livestock because of, of uh, the territorial coyotes and not all coyote groups are learning to kill wool, wool, uh, uh, livestock, that's true. That is a true effect. But it is something that's not going to work everywhere and it's not necessarily going to be an effect that lasts very long. There's also the notion that if you go in and kill a bunch of coyotes in an area and kill breeding pairs, that you'll end up with kind of a, 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 a free-for-all going on with dispersers coming in trying to establish new territories. And in that free-for-all, you may actually end up with more breeding pairs within the, the same area. So instead of having five breeding pairs, you might have 15 as they're sort of sorting things out as they're scrambling for space. That can create more problems for livestock producers um, as well. But that's another circumstance in which in probably, if, you, if those coyotes were hammered in terms of their population density, if, they were, if that wasn't a continuous process, the coyotes that move back in, scramble for space, in about four or five years, it's all gonna be sorted out, and they'll probably be back to almost the same way they were before they were, in, they were, they were um, removed or heavily harvested. Um, and so, again, another, another kind of a notion of sort of, um, uh, call it counterintuitive notion of, you know, you don't want to go in and necessarily blast away at every coyote in an area because you, you might actually be worsening your problem. Um, 
it's true for a certain time period in certain places, but it doesn't carry for all circumstances by any means. Well, I say coyotes are pre major predators on neonate fawns, but so are black bears. This is one of the, the pieces of data that we do not have for much of the Northeast, is the, the, the role that black bears play on uh, mortality of neonate fawns um, and deer in general. Um, we know in my work in Alaska um, that it could be as high as 40% as of the fawns every year are taken by black bears. When you generally, when you find a dead fawn from a black bear, you just, you don't see hardly anything except you usually find right down here, you'll see the lower jaw of the deer. And typically you'll get that lower jaw there because I think it's probably the, the, ma the most massive bone in a deer fawn's mouth, a deer fawn's body actually. Um, and, uh, and the bears just don't chew it up as, as well as they do all the other parts, so they leave it behind. But you don't find much else. Um, and of course, the, the, the predation by bears on neonate fawns, and I'll talk in a minute here, um, we need to know whether it's compensatory or additive. And the same thing with coyotes, you need to know whether it's compensatory or additive to understand what's actually happening in the population, how it affects deer. Um, People think of predation, predator-prey -predator communities is fairly simple. You know, in this case, you've got your uh, wildlife day shifts, you've got your predators coming in and punching the clock on one side, and your deer looking very apprehensive, punching the clock on the other side. Uh, doesn't exactly work that way. Um, the other one here, this is, a, this is, a, is a, a sort of a common notion of, of, um, of, of predation. You know, I know you miss the Wainwrights, Bobby but they were weak and stupid people, and that's why we have wolves and other large predators. Um, the idea that you know, predators uh, call the weak uh, out of the population and are actually doing you know, a, a great benefit to the prey population, and there's truth to that. It's not, it's not false, it's not true, but it doesn't necessarily lead to a balance. And this is, brings me to this point. All of you, I'm sure, have seen some documentary on wildlife in which the end comment is we need to preserve the fragile balance of the coral reef or we need to preserve the fragile balance of the Amazon rainforest or we need to preserve the fragile balance of the grassland ecosystems. If those balances were so fragile, those systems wouldn't exist. Um, and so it isn't a fragile balance and what balance does occur has, is very short-lived because something happens, a fire, winter, Flooding, um, a change in animal population due to disease, um, an invasion of an invasive species, um, all these disturbances, a road, a city, um, all of these disturbances cause a disturbance that upsets that fragile balance of nature. And the fragile balance is kind of dictated or, or illustrated here in this, this model. This is a deer wolf model that I wrote for the Fish and Wildlife Service. Um, back a, a decade or so ago. Um, but this, this shows you, you, here you have a deer population and they're at carrying capacity. That dotted line is carrying. That's the, the maximum that the landscape can support, the maximum deer landscape can support. And they're at carrying capacity and you introduce your wolves and this could be coyotes. And the wolves go up in population very rapidly, feeding on those deer. The deer go correspondingly down and eventually they sort of oscillate in, together in synchronicity and they reach some sort of an equilibrium, which is, dic is shown here by this, uh, what we call phase plane diagram. This is just wolf density or wolf population versus deer population. And they're coming around, they're spiraling into a common equilibrium, a common point. So in other words, they're reaching some sort of, of a balance. The problem with this picture is at some point along here, a bad winter comes in and K goes down here. And all of a sudden, this whole thing is no longer synchronous any longer. Wolf predation and coyote predation um, has three basic effects, and most predators have three basic effects on, um, on any prey population. They can have no effect. This is typical of insects. And most insect populations that are preyed upon, um, they tend to die because winter comes. They don't die because the predator keeps them in balance. Um, they reproduce and they're there uh, in great numbers until a frost comes and kills them all. The, the predator is just following suit, ba basically hanging on to its prey source. Then there's regulation. Regulation is like adjusting the nozzle on a hose. 
So in regulation, you're not limiting the prey population to a lower level necessarily than they could actually achieve based on the carrying capacity of the landscape, but you're getting rid of, of the peaks and the troughs. You're mitigating them. You're, you're smoothing them out. That's regulation. And in most cases, in most studies of coyote predation on deer, and particularly on those that looked at large scales, like most of the Northeast or most of the Midwest, large scale um, data sets, they tend to indicate that coyotes, in most cases, are regulating deer numbers at best. They're either having almost no effect, or if they're having any effect at all, they're regulating. However, there are some exceptions to that, and one of the studies down in Georgia showed pretty clearly that coyote predation on deer was limiting the deer population, and that's the third category here, limitation. Limitation means that the predator is keeping the prey down to a level lower than it could achieve without the predator in place, and it is suppressing it at that level. If the predator population was reduced or eliminated, the prey population would rise and grow to its, its, its maximum, its, its potential maximum. Um, and so in the absence of the predator, um, the population is going to be approaching K. In the presence of the predator, it's going to be well below K. So that's limitation. Saying, it says nothing about the peaks and troughs. It just says that the predator is like a cap. And in those kinds of a systems, if you enhance the habitat for the prey, if they're truly limited, if you enhance the habitat for the prey so they produce more offspring, instead of seeing more prey develop in your habitat, it's all siphoned off by the predator. You see more prey, predators, smaller home ranges, more breeding pairs, all right? That's what true limitation is about. Um, and there is not much evidence, except for what I mentioned in um, Georgia, of limitation by coyotes. But it's not impossible. And there are circumstances which could arise that could create that. I discussed one with the, in the case of prey switching with snowshoe hare. But if you had a situation where in a part of Vermont, for example, that experienced a number of, of severe winters, um, that deer were really hammered in those winters, predation by coyote, coyotes, which might be at a relatively low level in all other circumstances, except when that deer population is, is plummeted, and they're doing fine on snowshoe hare, and so the incidental killing of any deer in that population by the coyotes is in fact suppressing that deer population to a lower level than it could achieve if the coyotes were removed from the area. So that is plausible. That's, um, I don't think anyone's documented anything like that in Vermont, but the circumstances are certainly there. There could be those circumstances, but they're not gonna be general. It's not something you're gonna see all over the state. It's very unlikely that that would be the case. Getting back to this again, so this, you see these, these um, um, the predator is actually mitigating the, um, uh, the, the, the variation in the prey population. That's regulation, smoothing out the curves. But the fact that that population of deer is that far below K, that's limitation, okay? That's the difference between those two. And you really need to know that before you decide to go in and do predator control somewhere because the outcomes based on that are going to be very, very different. Um, anyway, let me get... You also need to know about compensatory and additive mortality. Compensatory mortality is, or predation, is when an animal prey is killed by a predator, but that animal would have died from something else during that year anyway. So for example, it could be a neonate fawn killed by a coyote or a bear, but there's a good chance that a number of those fawns are gonna die in winter anyway. So those that would have died in winter anyway, that's compensatory mortality. Additive mortality is the mortality taking those fawns or taking adult deer that is additive to what would normally occur, the mortality that would normally occur. So it is additional mortality to the system as opposed to just substituting, substituting sources. It's actually adding mortality to the system or additive mortality. This is an example of um, compensatory mortality based on, um, so this, is, this is deer and wolf work in, um, in Alaska, but it, 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 it says what I want. Um, just pay attention to Prince Wales Island and Hecate Island here, and you can see that the biggest sources of mortality for these deer populations, these are radio collared deer, were humans. People killed most of the deer, my radio collared deer that, that died. 
um, the biggest percentage of them that, that were a uh, uh, biggest source of mortality. Wolves are right behind at 7 and 11, pretty darn, pretty darn close. And pretty close to between these islands, a little bit higher in Hecata, a little bit lower on, on Prince of Wales. But here is a big difference. Bears, black bears. The neat thing about working on islands is that you have natural laboratories. Well, in this case, my study area here was very close to Hecata Island, very similar habitat, very similar weather conditions. Prince of Wales has wolves and black bears. Hecata has only wolves. And so the black bears are absent. So now you have, a, you have a controlled experiment here. And what we noticed here is that, in this case, the bears took a lot of deer. But the other sources of mortality, which were mainly winter loss because of, of snow and, and, and a severe winter, was almost non-existent. But on Hecata Island, no bears took those deer. But look how many died from other sources. In this case, it was winter loss. That's compensatory mortality, because at the end of the day, the percentage dead in both these populations is not that much different. 46%, almost 47% versus about 52%. So that's evidence of compensatory mortality. If it was additive mortality, this bear mortality would inflate this tremendously. And you would, you would, uh, you would, you would see a lot more deer uh, being affected by, by uh, predation uh, in terms of population of deer. When a deer population grows, it shows a growth curve, what we call a Ricker curve. This is, this is like compound growth, compound interest, all right? You're, you've got an interest rate, and that interest rate is determined, R, is determined by births minus deaths, okay? So if births are way beyond deaths, you're going to increase. If deaths are equal or larger than births, you're going to decrease. Um, so your interest rate is determined by births minus deaths, all right? And typically, the net annual recruitment, these are, that's your interest. That's what you are building your principal with every year. Principal is only growing if you have that interest. Well, these are the young of the year. They may also be immigrants and, and, and uh, migrants, but we'll, we'll ignore those for the moment. Think of these as the young of the year. That is what is being added to the population. That is also the numbers of animals, the pool of animals that you can take from hunting, predators, accidental death, without causing the principal to go down. So the population doesn't decrease. So this curve represents the, the, the pool of those individuals that can be debited from the population without causing the population to go down. And with a deer population, moose population, caribou population, they tend to grow very rapidly when their densities relative to carrying capacity are very low. Everybody's got food. Everybody's reproducing. All the fawns are surviving. And they're reproducing and they're increasing very rapidly. But as they increase rapidly, as they go further along, R starts to decline towards carrying capacity. In this case, births minus deaths is getting smaller, 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 where at carrying capacity, the births equal the deaths. In animals in which you have a fairly linear shape like this to this reduction, these are animals we call, they're very sensitive to density dependence. In other words, they're sensitive to their own densities and their own competition for food. Moose are a good example of this. They tend to produce a record curve with a good even parabola shape. When you look at white-tailed deer, they don't show any of these effects in burst minus deaths until you start really getting close to K. In other words, it's delayed. That decline is not linear. It's actually a negative exponential. And what that produces is this, a much bigger arc, because the, the effects of density dependence are being delayed closer to carrying capacity. The difference here, and the reason I point this out, is that this is the evolutionary indications that deer, white-tailed deer, are well adapted to predation because their strategy, based on their demographics, is to out-reproduce whatever's killing them. Moose, on the other hand, and caribou, on the other hand, that is not the case. They're much more sensitive to their environment, their, their, their carrying capacity. Deer just blast out uh, fawns and new recruits as fast as they can until they start starving, and then they tend to really collapse. And that's what's indicated here. Now, the importance of this is that you need to know where your deer population is on that record curve 
before you can tell what effect you might have if you go in and kill all the predators. Let me just... Um, because if you are going in there to remove predators, you want to know whether your deer population is, uh, is it close to carrying capacity or is it well below carrying capacity that it has the potential to really grow sustainably or at least healthily. Um, and one of the things that happens is in a population, if that carrying capacity is diminished, the area under this curve, which is the pool of recruits, is going to decrease in a negative exponential fashion. In other words, it's going to go to hell in a handbasket really quick as carrying capacity goes down because it's going to reduce this in a nonlinear way so that you're not going to be able to have resilience in the system for, for, uh, that you had originally with, with a very rich system where carrying capacity is very high. So carrying capacity is a driver of the, the, the dynamics as well as the volatility in a predator-prey system. When you have low K, you're tending to see populations of prey all over North America in which predators have a bigger role in keeping them suppressed in their numbers in and in actually limiting their numbers. And so here you go. Here you have this Ricker curve here showing population growth of net random recruitment in deer. And in this situation, you have this red line indicates the, the, the portion of these, this interest that is being removed by the predator. Um, and you can see what happens in a situation where um, you have reduction in carrying capacity. Um, you have the predators. The predators aren't necessarily declining in synchrony with your deer population, which is pressed for food because carrying capacity has declined. So they're keeping their numbers. They're feeding on snowshoe hare. They're feeding on beaver. They're feeding on something else. In the case of wolves, they're feeding on salmon. Their numbers don't go down necessarily relative to, let's say, the, the deer numbers. So they're as you move carrying capacity down, this area here above that red line is quite large here, but when you're reducing carrying capacity to here, that area is a lot smaller. And eventually you go down even further, that area might be entirely below that red line. So you're looking at a population that's becoming less and less resilient to predation. It's gonna be much more sensitive to a predator. And there certainly could be circumstances in Vermont where these conditions might exist, probably in some places like Caledonia County where you typically have heavy snows, you might have a circumstance which might create this kind of position. The key thing here though, is before you go in and decide you're gonna remove your predators out of a population, you need to know whether you're here. If you draw a straight line across here, okay, like here, this red line, all right, you have two places where net recruitment is the same. You have it here and you have it here. If you're here, if you were to remove the predator from the population, you probably could see that population of prey increase dramatically very, and actually respond well to that re reduction in, in predators. But if you're over here, you're going to drive them right to K. And then K is going to be diminished because they're going to overbrowse the range. K is going to be diminished. And now you're in this death spiral, where now you're in this lower curve. And maybe you do the same thing again and you mistake the fact that the deer are here instead of over here, and you drive in the K again, you run that back down further, and eventually you're into a death spiral. Your system is gonna become incredibly volatile and incredibly um, unresilient. So you have to know where you are before you go in and plan some sort of big removal. You have to know by looking at the deer. So in this situation, those deer are gonna be healthy, everyone's gonna be reproducing, the fawns are going to be surviving at a, at a fairly high level, or they're going to be in good condition at birth. They may be being killed by bears and, and, and coyotes, but at least the condition of the deer are going to look really good. So the browsing levels in winter range and summer range are going to be low. Here, you're going to have a different situation. They're going to be in worse condition. There's going to be higher browsing levels. So you have to have those kinds of data to be able to tell you which, where you are relative to carrying capacity. Um, otherwise, you're not going to really be able to predict what the outcome is going to be if you go in and try to manage that situation with a predator removal. So when we, and when we talk about predator removal, um, again, I came from an agency that did a lot of it. When you go in and do a predator removal project, you don't go in with a coyote derby. You don't even just liberalize your trapping 
laws, or bag limits and seasons, or your hunting bag limits or seasons. You go in with probably paid people, but in some ways compensated people, who do nothing but kill the predator. And they kill every predator that they can find with the hope of almost eliminating the predators entirely from the region of, of interest. It's not recreation. It's a dirty, ugly business. But that's the only way you end up getting to the point where you may see an effect on the prey population. And secondly, one of the worst things you can do, one of the worst decisions you can make as a public agency is to go into something like that, a program of, of predator control, and not one know for, for a fact that, that it's going to respond the way you think it's going to respond, two, not reduce enough of the predator to show a difference, and three, not to have a monitoring program in place so you can detect those differences. So if you say you're going to increase buck harvest on deer, that you can show that you are increasing buck harvest on deer. Because if you can't go there, if you can't provide those data, you cannot show that your program worked and it becomes a political nightmare, public and political nightmare, because these programs are always controversial. So you, when you go into a program like this, you go in with the idea that you're going to go and you're going to clobber that prey pop predator population and you're going to set it up in such a way that you're going to see an effect if, in fact, you've made the right decision about where those deer are relative to K, you're going to be able to detect it. The worst thing you can do is not be able to do that, that detection, to have a program going on and nobody can really tell if it's working. P publicly, that's a nightmare. That's a death sentence, publicly. Um, and so you prepare for these with data and you prepare for these with a real effort to make it happen. You don't do this by having a coyote derby. That really, I mean, I, I have no issues with that so much that I don't think it's hurting coyote populations any, anywhere, um, but it's not a predator control program. It's not really probably going to achieve the goal that you might think it is. And it might actually not be worse. It might create a worse situation. Um, so anyway, predator control is a serious business. Um, and we did a lot of it. Um, it even involved killing bears. It wasn't just wolves. We were actually out there knocking off brown bears and black bears, killing cubs in the dens, killing pups in the dens, um, doing whatever was necessary efficiently to essentially eliminate predators from the landscape. And we had to do that before you could see really any major effect on the population of, in this case, moose and caribou. Um, so when we talk about um, predation, of course, we, you think about the predator and its direct interaction with the animal, killing the animal, taking it down. But there are a lot of landscape features that are important to the risk factors involved between predator and prey. Deer on a slope have hope. Deer on a flat and the wolves and coyotes are fat. When, you, when a deer has a, an opportunity to get on a slope, and in fact, 10 degrees or more reduces risk of predation by 50%. So terrain, terrain matters. It really matters a lot. Um, on a flat, it's much tougher um, because the, you, you, you have less probability of detection of the predator, and two, you don't have as much escape terrain. A hillside, especially a, a, a forested, uh, rugged hillside, is a way for a deer to escape predation. Um, so the topography is important in terms of creating risk landscapes. So when you create a deer yard or you preserve a deer yard, winter habitat for deer, man, the most important places you want to be thinking about are the hillsides. There certainly are going to be lowland thickets that might be very important, but those hillsides are going to be prime and especially those hillsides on east, south, or west-facing slopes. Those should be the prime areas of concern for, for conserving deer winter range, and because they're also probably the least risky for them in terms of predation by coyotes. The other thing to consider on landscape level is that edge matters. Deer respond well to a greater degree of edge. And the more edge there is, they tend to not, not, not only find more food, they don't have to go as far to find it, they also have available escape cover to escape predation. So finer, more edge leads to lower risk of predation. And this is true with wolves. It'd be true with coyotes. Um, it'd be true with um, um, uh, uh, red wolves in the, in, in the southeast. Um, the coarser areas, more big 
um, blocks of land that are, that are chopped up as opposed to small patches, um, you're going to have higher risk of predation. And in terms of cost of locomotion for deer in wintertime with snow in the ground, lower cost of locomotion here because you're closer to food. You also have interception of, of a, the tree canopy to reduce the amount of, of, of snow that's on the ground. And I'm not talking necessarily about deer yards. Um, this kind of habitat is really good in summer as well as winter. But in, in winter, in early winter, before they're really yarded up, they're still feeding pretty heavily. And be able to go close to an area where they can get food pretty rel uh, easily without having to wade through deep snow is, is a real benefit. Um, so cost of locomotion is a lot lower where edge is, is finer, there's greater edge. The bigger the, the blocks, the coarser the landscape, the cost of locomotion is going to be generally higher unless you're all in forest. But if you have big blocks of open ground, that cost of locomotion can be a lot harder. So in your landscapes, finer and more edge is probably not only going to provide a better landscape for food for deer, but it's also going to provide um, a bit of risk reduction from predation. And so finally tonight, I'm just going to mention the, the, the ball in the box. This is a, a, a meme I use to try to get this idea of um, how the landscapes and carrying capacity really define the behaviors and drive these systems, these predator-prey systems, um, as much or more so than the actual interactions between the predator and prey. So if you can think of this box as representing all the resources that the, wool, the coyotes, the bears, and people, and deer need to, to make for a sustainable deer population and harvesting and predation. Um, this ball here represents all those dynamics. Everything, it's a super ball, so if it hits something, it bounces really erratically. And as long as that box is really big, that super ball has a lot of space to wander around. And a super ball, this is, you know, this is the balance of nature right there. Well, it never exists. It's always going to be disturbed in some way. So it's going to move around in reality. It's not going to sit in the middle. It's going to move around. And if the box is big enough, that ball never touches the side. The behavior can vary from year to year, decade to decade, but it never collapses. It never finds a, a volatility that causes it to become extremely variable, to, to collapse one species perhaps becoming very, very uh, rare in, t in terms of this population density, very, very low population density. But now when you reduce that box, now you're making the situation a lot more difficult to maintain itself with any kind of resilience because now that ball could hit the sides of that box and you end up with a lot of erratic, chaotic behavior. Um, and so the size of that box really matters. But the other lesson here is that we tend to think in our management scenarios and our management ideas about creating stability in our game populations, our fur bearer populations. Trying to maintain stability in any of those populations is a red herring, and it's also a pipe dream. There is just no way that you can control enough of the parameters that control any of those populations, whether it's the weather, the landscape, the, the, the dynamics between the animals. Um, you can't control that enough to have stability. Um, stability is really a, a, a red herring. It's, it, it, like I said, it's a, it's a pipe dream. What you really want to manage for is resilience. You want that system to be able to bounce around, to be disturbed, to be um, uh, changed in some way, um, but still have enough space so it can move around wherever it goes and it's not going to crash. And by crash, I mean one species becomes very sparse um, and low density, or maybe d completely disappears. Or that the goals for those populations, like harvest goals, collapse on you. Um, so resilience is really the key here, not stability. Stability, you'll lose your mind. Here, you at least have a chance of actually accomplishing a goal. And of course, resilience then would lead to persistence. The more resilient a system is, the more persistent it's going. It's going to last longer. And this is going to be critical in the future here in Vermont, um, and as well as all over uh, Northeast, because there are dramatic changes that are coming um, that are going to challenge that resilience. Um, but um, if, if you maintain the, the habitats for deer, the critical habitats for deer, as much and as rich as you can, you're probably going to do the most you can to make sure that you have a sustainable 
deer population in the presence of coyotes, which would be extremely expensive and probably infeasible to get rid of uh, on, to any real extent that would be meaningful. Um, your really only choice you have is going to be to maintain resilient ecosystems that keep, those, keep that box as big as possible. Anyway, that is it. I'm done. <laughs> it's enough. No, no, John. No, nope. nope. And, and uh, um, you might be able to on a small area, but on a statewide basis, it would be really tough to do. Yep. We, tr we tried in Alaska. Well, Alaska, Vermont isn't as big as one Alaska county. I know, I know. I mean, we tried in Alaska, and it's, but the one thing in Alaska is in interior Alaska, because it's mostly open, um, mixed heart, well, actually, tundra, and, as well as, as a, a boreal forest. You can see things. So you can fly and you can count moose and caribou and wolves and um, can't do that here very well. Yeah. Concerning dispersal? Yes. Is that something that occurs at a certain time every year? Yeah. Uh, well, it, it does, it has a low um, presence throughout the entire year. But the rate of dispersal really picks up around the mating season, when, particularly when the, the uh, juveniles are reaching sexual maturity and they're really getting the urge to mate. Um, and that's a real inducement to get out of the basement. Well, is there a certain age when they're more likely to disperse or an age where they would not disperse and just stay with the group for the rest of their life? I don't think we know the latter part of that question. I don't think anybody knows that. Um, in terms of beginning dispersal, we know for coyotes that um, they, will, they, they will disperse in their first year if, if food drives them to do it. Um, and then they will disperse in their second year um, because of sexual maturity. Um, there are not a lot of evidence, I believe, for coyote family groups to have members that are older than two years, other than the breeding pair. Um, it's not like a wolf pack. This is where they differ from wolf packs. The one thing that I'm a little tentative, if you notice I'm a little tentative, I'm, I'm answering this. The one thing that's conceivable is that if they're adapting more to larger prey um, over time, they might form more of the structure you see in wolves than, they, than you typically see with the fluid coyote family groups year to year. So the, it could change. Um, and they are plastic. They can change. They're very adaptable. Patty Mullman has a great paper from Yellowstone about that plasticity. Um, so, yeah, I mean, the answer to your question is there's no... Uh, the, uh, what, I, what I gave you was, you know, probably the 75, 80% solution, but there's another 20% out there that they just don't fit the model. Yeah. Well, um, they could potentially live as long as a dog, you know, but, but, but in the wild, it's probably four or five years at most. Um, it does, they, are, they do live longer where they're not heavily persecuted by people, um, but generally they're going to be three to four years probably where they are, and maybe an average of five if you look at areas that have areas where they're not heavily harvested versus, you know, adjacent ones that are. Yeah, probably about five would be a, a pretty good guess. With the uh, males dying first, Females probably living a little longer, um, but no, they don't. And so that you know, five years would be the, probably the maximum that you could actually have one of those effects I was talking about about you know a coyote group forming that's not killing livestock, for example. I mean that effect is not going to last probably more than about two, three, maybe four years, and then something's going to kill the breeding pair or one of the breeding pair. Mm -hmm. And we, for years, we never had coyote problems. Last year, one came and mm -hmm. killed off almost our entire block. It happens. Mm -hmm. We understand almost everything about chickens. Help my dog sometimes. Mm -hmm. I have to go after them. Oh, I like chickens too. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, 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 they come. You know, it's one of those things. You, you're going to have predators. You have chickens. Yeah. Um, one of the things our neighbor had, and we actually were outside like two o'clock in the afternoon and saw the coyotes walk into mm -hmm. our yard and took 
one of our birds and ate it in the chicken pen. Um, and our neighbor freaked out because he assumed it was ill because what <laughs> animal would walk onto your yard at 2 o'clock and kill it and eat it in the chicken pen? A hungry coyote. Uh, and that's kind of what I assumed, and he was sure it was like ill of some sort and tried to hunt it down. Mm -hmm. um, I would assume that it does not mean that they're ill just because they no, in the middle no. of the afternoon to... <coughs> No. Have a snack in my front yard. Um, coyotes do tend, and I show this with the data from, from Vermont, um, that they do tend to spend more time active at night where they're heavily persecuted by people, hunted and trapped, or actually hunted more has the effect on them. Um, and wolves are the same way. They tend to, to become more nocturnal, but they can be active at any time. They're actually a, a, a daytime hunter, mostly. Oh, okay. No, and, okay. And, uh, yeah, yeah, they, 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 if they had their druthers, that's when they would hunt, because it's easier. Um, and uh, and uh, at nighttime, they do it because they're trying to be a lot more uh, cryptic, because they're getting killed. Our when they're beginning first, like the beginning of our flock disappeared in the middle of the night. We never closed them in at yeah. night, and they kind of just roamed yeah. if they saw fit until they went inside, or they were stupid and dug. Yeah. Um, and then, like, randomly, one day we came home, and out it walked. Killed the bird while us and the dogs were outside in the yard. Yeah, yeah. That 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 story though that bothers me a little bit because obviously he had no fear of you guys. Yeah, no. It just and we were maybe no more than 50, 60 feet away from it. We, like we were outside doing yard yeah. work, and uh, we have a golden retriever and a black lab, and we yeah. were down doing something in the yard, and our dog suddenly like stops, looks, and we see this nice coyote just walk across the lawn, pick up a bird, start munching it, look at us, drop the bird. <laughs> And yeah. walk back yeah. in the woods. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, I, I um, it, it does. I mean, I, I, I can't quite uh, get a sense of just how habituated that animal might have seemed. I, it does worry me when they become habituated. I mean, there's you know ways of doing that too, with dog food and with yeah. bird feeders and you know, that are you know close to the ground. Um, there's a number of ways you can get coyotes coming in, and chickens would be another one, right? And um, uh, and we that. We worried most about our dog because she's mm -hmm. golden and she thinks every yeah. freaking animal in the universe is her friend, and so yeah. she likes to go down and kind of like scout the area and just you know chases whatever's on our lawn. Yeah. The lawn for the hell of it. Um, and so yeah, Kylie's one of those things she does not want to go play. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I. We haven't seen it since it killed all our flock. We didn't get any more for a year. And I hope it doesn't uh, become a regular thing. Yeah. yeah. Seen any yet? No, it could also be a disperser that uh, just found a way to get an easy meal. It didn't seem terribly, like, I don't know how to tell the age of them or anything. Yeah. But it wasn't probably much bigger than our dog. And it was, mm -hmm. I mean, it was a nice looking coyote. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. That way. I mean, our neighbor yeah. did decide he was going to, like, try to go hunt it down. Mm -hmm. yeah. Apparently, chickens are delicious. They are. They, and they're easy. I mean, you, you don't risk much killing a chicken. <laughs> it just cleared the no. other time. not afraid to be in my yard. Mm -hmm. I see the tracks, those single tracks right. that mm -hmm. go right through my yard. Mm -hmm. I have two dogs. Mm -hmm. And my question is how I have a, my, one dog is um, 50 of, pounds and one is 60. Mm -hmm. How worried do I have to be about mm -hmm. those coyotes who are definitely coming through my dog, mm -hmm. through my yard, mm -hmm. bothering my dog? Now they're actually bothering the dogs. I mean, no, are they? Not. But but the, but, but the dogs are, are registering that they're there and getting bothered by the well, fact. They, I, one time, they, they, I have an underground fence, mm -hmm. so the dogs only have a certain mm -hmm. area they can be in, and the dogs are barking like crazy. I went out, and there are two coyotes. Right. Mm -hmm. So I took a jacket and put it over my head mm -hmm. and said, "Get out! Get out!" and kind of ran toward mm -hmm. them. And they just they turned around and they looked at me. What is your problem? They were not mm -hmm. afraid. Mm -hmm. That was and, us. So I am afraid of them being so comfortable, and would they hurt my dogs if I were 50? I, I kind of doubt your dogs are that size. Now, if you had a little wiener dog, um, that might work. <laughs> yeah, that might be a different story. Um, the the uh, um, it, it's you know 50, 60 pound dog is probably going to be able to do okay. The only thing is, I mean, it's. It's not, it would not be impossible that the coyotes would attack and, and uh, even dogs of that size. 
Um, I mean, I have the same thing going on. I have coyotes around me all the time. My dog goes out and she doesn't chase them, but she barks them, goes, does a whole perimeter and thing to, to um, and I'm not particularly worried that, that they're, they're going to attack. Um, but, you know, we, we said that before, you know, there was this big notion for years that, you know, wolves aren't, wouldn't never kill people in North America. You know, maybe in Europe there were stories about wolves attacking people. But we, we dismissed it for years, for decades, until, you know, in Alaska about five years ago, teacher was walking home, a pack of wolves came along and killed her nader. Um, and so I, I'm hesitant to say that there's no issue there for you. Um, I, I just don't know. Um, I, I, uh, um, uh, if obviously, don't encourage them in any way to be, to be nearby. Um, but I wouldn't be overly concerned about your dogs, really. I don't think there's, you know, the likelihood is that they're going to be bothered by them. Um, but it is, I don't think it's not, it's not impossible. I mean, I, that, I mean, I know I realize that's unsatisfactory, but that's, you know, I, you I can't give you no guarantees. Of course, at night, I can't see them. So what mm -hmm. I do is I go out with the dogs mm -hmm. with a headlamp on. Mm -hmm. And because I think they're not going to like that light. Do you think that is true or not? Oh, all coyotes come to the light. <laughs> and the light's on your head, so it's the worst spot you could have it. No, no, it's, 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 no, no. Um, the, the, um, no, no, I, I, I mean, I don't think you're at any real great risk. You don't think so? I don't no. need to do that. <laughs> no, I, I don't think so. I, okay. I, I don't. Well, thank you. I don't think, I mean, the reason I say that, I, I've done this kind of stuff myself quite a bit, and I, I, um, you know, I go and play with the coyotes around my place all the time. I mean, I just, I, I, I howl with them and, uh, and, and let them know that the boss is there because my howl is not a coyote howl. It's, it's a wolf howl, and uh, it's, it's a little bit more intimidating for them. But um, I, I um, so I, I've been fairly close to a lot of them in my adjacent area around, around where I live in Braintree, and, and I never feel... Threatened. I never feel like I'm getting nervous about them. But I have to say that, you know, they're a wild animal, and the one thing that changes everything is they look to people for food. So in other words, they can, they can be curious about you, and they can be maybe not worried by you, but it's when they change from that to being your source of food, that's when the problem arises, and that's, that's where I worry about it. I'm not sure how you know that. If you understand what I'm saying. Yeah. I'm not sure how you know that that's the case. Uh, and so, I, I mean, I, I, um, they're going to be there. I mean, and even if they were eliminated, there's going to be other coyotes coming in. So it's going to be one of those things where you're just going to have to see for yourself. Yeah, well, probably, because I'm not afraid of them at all. Mm -hmm. yeah. I just don't want them to get my dog. Yeah, I know. I, and I, I don't want them to get my dog either. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for example, my, my, I don't just let Willow out running free. She's, she's, she's confined. You've got a, a, a underground uh, invisible fence, so they're confined. Um, so right there, you've taken a big effort to, to safety-wise um, for those animals. If they wandered off like some people's dogs do, they could be toast. Yeah. You, I think you had, you had your hand up for a while. Right. Uh huh. Uh, they would kill a cat in an instant. Yeah. Yeah, especially one that's just wandering out like that. Mm -hmm. Oh, they just love that. I mean, that would just. Oh, that would that would just be a. Oh, they just you know they just get their tooth hooked on that collar and the cat comes right with them. Yeah. Well, I'm not sure what you mean by personality of them. Um, yeah, I mean they're 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 very much like wolves and and uh, um, um, you know uh, foxes are a bit more cat-like, they're a bit more edgy. Coyotes are not nearly as edgy. Um, they're more curious. They're more again like I said more like wolves. They're very intelligent. Um, they're fascinating to be around and watch because they are so smart that they're you you can watch them solving problems and it's really fascinating to watch that. Um, so their, their personalities are very much like, like wolves. And, and, you know, to, if you can kind of think a bit, uh, an extension of that would be like dogs. 
um, they're going to show very much the same sort of natural behaviors dogs do. They're not going to show the behaviors that we bred into dogs. In other words, the difference between coyotes and wolves and your domestic dog, and remember, your domestic dog is a wolf. It's all the same species. It's Canis lupus. Um, but the difference is it's had 15,000 years of direct selection by human beings to get rid of any wolf-like traits, right. like attacking you, your kid because you are the alpha male in the family and, and your kid is a threat. You know, that's, that, that's, you know that, that's, what you, that's what we bred out of dogs. Right. Um, and it took, you know, we didn't do that in a year. It took 15,000 years. Um, so it, it's, a, it's a case where, where uh, they are, they're going to be very dog-like in a lot of those features. Facial recognition, the signals, the cues, you know, wagging the tail, barking, howling, all of those things. The, their expressions on their faces. Um, I'll tell you a little quick story. Um, talking about, and I mean, coyotes are going to be the same way. But um, So I was darting deer. This is a heck of an island, and I was concealed by a, a logging road. And I'm blowing a fawn bleat, and a big male wolf comes by, down, trotting down the road. And we, we had radio collars on some of these wolves on, on Hecate Island. And we knew where the den was, because we, we knew we actually counted the puppies on the den. But this is in August when they, they abandon the dens, and they're going to meet with pups at what they call rendezvous points. Um, and so this, this male just went trucking down the road, and I just watched it and listened. It went off into a muskeg, and I heard a lot of barking, or a lot of howling and yipping, and you know, it was a very joyful sound, because it was coming together for food. Um, he's bringing food to the pups at this rendezvous site. So I said, great, now I know where the rendezvous site is. So it was a perfect day, it was drizzly, drizzly uh, a little bit wind blowing in the right direction. So I went down the road, and I, I was in this big open heath area called a muskeg, and I was able to approach the wolves from the downwind side from a, a slightly slower, a lower slope, so I could come up hidden from them. And when I came over the little, little ridge where I could see them, and there were some stunted hemlock trees, I was really close. I was like, they were like from me to you, basically. Um, and so, <laughs> so I'm watching them. They had no idea I was there. And I'm watching them, and so there's, <laughs> there's, there's pups. And the pups are playing, and there's one, I think it must have been a male pup, because it was the biggest of the pups, the biggest little litter. And it was playing with the, the alpha male, the big male wolf. And it would nuzzle around, and then it would bite his tail. And the, the wolf would just shake him off, and, and you know, he'd get really irritated. And the little guy would run away a little bit, and then you know, no more than about 30 seconds later, he's right over there sniffing around and biting the wolf's tail. Well, finally, this big male got fed up with this. And he gets up, and he walks, and he walks right into me. So I'm behind this little hemlock tree, and this big male comes trotting down, and he looks up, and he finally sees me. And if there is an emotion of confusion that a dog can portray, this was perfect. This animal looked at me like, what the hell are you doing here? <laughs> and and uh, um, he, he, he just, he looked wide-eyed, and he trotted away. He didn't make any noise. He trotted away from me. He turned around and looked again, and he was like, are you still here? And then he walks around, he made no sound, but just the way he carried himself, his tail, his back was tense, he was all tense. Every animal in that little group knew something was wrong, and they all ran away, they melted away, disappeared into the forest. So the game's up, I walk out, <laughs> and, and out of the woods, edge of the woods comes the alpha female, comes mom, and she's barking and howling and barking and howling at me. And, and so what she's doing, she's pushing me along, right? And then what she would do is she would run past me to the direction she wanted me to go. And she'd just kind of sit there and act kind of funny. She actually would lie down. And what she was doing, she was trying to get my attention. So I would walk towards her, and then she'd get behind me, bark and howl, bark and howl, and then she'd go to the, past me again, lie down and do all this. And she was just basically doing like a broken wing or whatever, trying to get me to get out of there and lead away. Um, and, you know, I, she followed me about a quarter mile um, <laughs> down the road doing this. So they are very much like dogs. They really are in a lot of ways. Coyotes would be the same way. Yeah. Yeah. A couple of questions. Uh, it's been documented quite a lot that wolves go on killing sprees, whether it's blood sport or anything like that. W wolves go on killing sprees? Killing sprees. It's been documented. 
Um, I haven't, I still got a question. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. My point is, have you ever seen any instances of coyotes? No, no not that I've seen. Um, no, no, I have not. Um, if I've ever seen a, a carcass of a deer um, and, and uh, that, that's, that's been taken down by, by coyotes, it's just been one deer. Um, it, there hasn't been like a bunch of them, like they get into a wintering area or something, and you've got deer everywhere that are dead. Um, the, 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 um, um, let me just answer your two parts. Ago. First, in terms of, of, of kills, one thing you do have to be careful, and this is something all of you to, to, to know, is when you see a dead carcass out there, deer carcass out there, it doesn't necessarily mean it's predation. Even if there's wolf, uh, coyote tracks around it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's predation. That could have been an animal that was dead for some other reason, hit by a car, lost from a hunter, died of the winter, and it's being scavenged um, by coyotes. Um, and you can tell the difference usually because if it was a kill, parts are gonna be scattered around big area, and there's generally, if you're there early enough, there's gonna be blood everywhere. There's gonna be, there's gonna be sign of a struggle. Um, it's not gonna be like this curled up animal lying there um, that's being you know, torn apart by whatever's feeding on it right there. Um, because when an when animal dies from, let's say, uh, from starvation, you know, all its blood pools in its body cavity. So there's not this big splash of blood all around in that area. Um, so it's, it's usually pretty clear to be able to tell the difference between what's predation and what isn't. Uh, and of course, coyotes are gonna kill, or they're gonna, they're gonna feed on carcasses. They're gonna scavenge as much as they're gonna, they're gonna kill. Now getting back to your, your, your killing sprees, I don't really like that term because it's not really accurate for what the animal is doing. They do surplus kill. The term is surplus kill, which means they're killing more than they need at the moment. Um, and there's some talk about wolves now. It's been documented that they will surplus kill. The thing is, it's not like blood sport. It's because they have an advantage on their prey. They've got a chance to kill a lot of food and they just go ahead and do it. In other words, they don't just say, oh, we'll just take two. We'll just take, take one and, and save the rest for later. No, they have, they, have the advantage, they have the advantage at that moment. They have the opportunity that they're going to kill as much as they can because they're making their living on their feet. They're not, nobody's feeding them. They have to go out and get it. So, so if you were in that circumstance, you'd probably do the same damn thing. Um, so yes, they can surplus kill. Yes, they can kill more than they can eat at any one moment. Um, and it, doesn't always, it always, doesn't always follow that they come back and clean up the rest and scavenge them. They do sometimes, but sometimes they just leave them. I mean, they, and, and, uh, and we, of course, would think, well, that's a big waste. Well, one of the really important things in the Arctic is that those kinds of kills and even the ones in which were not a, a, a surplus kill, which is just a single animal, but they didn't consume the entire carcasses. That's what keeps Arctic foxes alive. That's what keeps ravens alive. Some places, that's what keeps polar bears alive. Um, and so it doesn't necessarily have a, you know, it, we might look on it as a problem. It's not necessarily ecologically a problem. Um, but it's, it's what I would term as surplus killing, not killing sprees. You had to ask the right tool. Anyhow, uh, another question. My second question was, wolves eliminated from the Northeast in the late 1800s. Mm -hmm. So man became the ultimate predator to replace the wolf. Mm -hmm. I submit that. I'm pretty sure I'm accurate. So now you have a pile, which is an invasive species, which infiltrates from the West, comes to the East. Why isn't an invasive species treated like zebra mussels or Eurasian milfoil or something like that by all the biologists here? Why do they not consider them in the same tone as Eurasian milfoil or uh, you know, zebra mussels? Why are they treated differently? Is that because they're like doggies? No, it's because they, won't, they don't consider them an invasive species. Pardon? They don't consider them an invasive species. But you got it up on your... Yeah, but, they're, they're, but, but they're, they moved around North America. They didn't come from overseas somewhere. They came from the Western U.S. Um, you have turkey vultures. Turkey so vultures. You say non -indigenous they're they're indigenous, indigenous to North America, but they're just not indigenous to Vermont. What? Turkey vultures. Should, should, you know, should we call turkey vultures invasive species? 
because they, they, they were not indigenous to Vermont. They've moved up basically following the roads. Um, so first off, the, the answer to the question, well, they're not considered invasive species. They're considered a natural component of the North American ecosystems. Now they are. Sure, sure. Um, and, and I mean, wolves, you know, wolves, um, uh, putting wolves, let's say, back into Yellowstone, are they invasive? Wolves were not, they were extirpated from, from Yellowstone. We put the wolves back in, was that an invasive species? Um, I don't think so. Um, some people might not like the idea, but still, it, it was not what you call an invasive species. But wolves were there before. Mm -hmm. Coyotes weren't here before. Well, but, but certainly wolves were here before. I understand that. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about coyotes. Right, no, I understand, I know that. But the, 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 still, they are, it's, it's not like they're coming over from China someplace, or not like they're coming over from Europe where they have no connections with the ecosystems in North America. They, they have very well have connections with ecosystems. And you know, something like zebra mussels, well zebra mussels come into an environment and exploit it because they have no natural predators. We have plenty, or they, we have you know, the same predators that kill wolves are still alive today. You're one of them. So it's, it's, uh, it's not quite the same circumstance as what you would call zebra mussels or some other invasive species like that. So you're not advocating open borders? <laughs> so, uh, we'll take no. one more, maybe one more sure. question in sure. the wrap up. Yeah. Quick question. Um, when you hear a pack yipping and barking at night, what are they saying? Um, there's, there's a variety of things. If, if, uh, if it's like a single howl, it, uh, but, 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 okay, but uh, so, so yipping and, um, it can be a, a number of things. One, it can be the group coming together. They've been separated hunting and now they come together. Depending on the time of year, it could be the, um, the uh, breeding pair coming back with food in their bellies, in their guts, that they're going to then regurgitate to the puppies. And they oftentimes will make, that's when you hear, especially in um, July and early August, you'll hear this you know, crazy yipping howling. And oftentimes that's the breeding pair coming back with food. Um, and sometimes they do it even when they're not, food isn't involved, just because they've been apart and they come together again. And they, there's, a, there's a certain amount of, of, of uh, exuberance from that. And then you have howling, and sometimes howling actually means what you think it sounds like. It sounds like a really lonely sound. It can mean, in fact, that you've got a lonely wolf or wolf, lonely coyote out there. Yep. It can mean just that. So thank you all for coming. Thanks. I appreciate it.